So welcome. So without further ado, I don't believe in, in long introductions. So I'll just say that I'm extremely fortunate to have known Brad for ages, that he's a great friend, an inspiration, a thought leader, and uh, now he's going to enlighten us on Peak Japan. So let's clap. I hope you don't I don't like long introductions. Yeah, no, no, that's good. It, it wasn't long, but it was enough to make me nauseous. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you, Robert. Thank you all for coming out on a less than gorgeous day. Although I suppose if it was a nice day, people would be out having fun rather than coming here to hear me chat. Um, it is a, a pleasure to be back here at, 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 at Temple. It's good to see so many friends and people who, some of whom I haven't seen for 20 years. I guess it is Tom or Tag, who I haven't seen for oh, probably only a decade or so, I think, uh, and some other folks in the room as well. Um, so we're here to talk about Peak Japan, which is for sale over here. And I would urge you to, to buy the book, number one, because it's mine. Secondly, because I have a five-year-old son, and that's his college fund. And you know, if you don't buy the book and I don't get sufficient royalties from that, I'm probably going to have to sell him into slavery of some sort <laughs> at some point. Um, and, so I would, and I've grown attached to the kid, so it would be really nice to give him a future, so I, I ask you to to buy the book. Thank you. Um, I presume, I, I would like to think that everybody's already read it, in which case you guys can just ask me questions, right? No? no? <laughs> this is not working out as I planned. Um, so I'll, let me explain then what the hell's going on, why I wrote the book, and a very quick summary, and hopefully a quick summary. Since we've got a lot of time, I'll try to get through this reasonably fast, and then you can ask me questions about anything in the analysis, and we can argue and, and you can shatter the, my life's work and, and um, we'll call it a night. Um, this book was five years in the making, which was far longer than it should have been, but nevertheless was an interesting process. It was born in the aftermath of March 11th, uh, the, the triple catastrophe. And I, um, I was contacted by a, a foundation and they asked, you know, basically this guy, the, the, the funder said, is this going to be another Meiji moment for Japan? Is this going to be the turning point for the country? And um, I thought, that's a pretty good question. And while it kind of sounds absurd today, what we know looking back, you know, eight years after March 11th, uh, in fact, if you recall, it was actually a pretty reasonable question at the time. I was uh, hosting a big US-Japan uh, conference of foreign policy, all the alliance managers types, about three weeks after the disaster. And all of the Japanese people from Gaimu Show, from Bowie Show, all, all the you know the thinkers and intellectuals at that time were all were talking about how important this was for the country, how it could in fact have really proven to be a pivot moment. And but the thing that we Americans needed to be aware of that as Japan attempted to grapple with this, that we should not be concerned that Japan would be turning all of its energies inward and Japan would continue to remain engaged with the world around us. So I mean, the idea that this was going to be some kind of pivotal moment in contemporary Japanese history wasn't absurd. Um, although, as we all I think know that we, we, you know, in retrospect at this point, the idea that this was going to be a, a change was in fact, you know, uh, Hope was in the air and hope is now gone, and rain is in the air today. Um, but the answer to that question, you know, just coming up and deciding that, you know, no, this is not going to be a major moment, I didn't think was going to make my funders pretty happy. Uh, they gave me far too much money at that particular time for me to just turn around and give them a one word telegram or a postcard for that matter. So I figured if it's not going to be a major moment, then the question would have to be why not? And so then I embarked on an effort to try to understand what it was about Japan. And what was it in this, that, that would guide and either inhibit or, if you will, facilitate the response? How would the country be dealing with a disaster of what was pretty impressive magnitude? I mean, the, the estimates of GDP were, you know, something like 5% of GDP was lost. And as you recall, the, the way that the entire country was reacting with its, you know, the, the, the end to all, of, all the Hanami parties and the fact that we were moving, you know, we, we can thank 311 for cool biz and super cool biz and extended cool biz and super extended cool biz because it still stays hot as long as it does. Um, you know, there were substantial changes that, that seemed to emanate from that particular moment in that crisis. And yet, the fundamentals of this country continue as they, you know, the trajectories were not changed. So, um, I started writing this book. I did a, about a year and change of interviews. And then I started, I wrote a 
sweeping assessment of Japan, and a, a big piece that looked at every facet of Japanese culture, of history, of politics, foreign policy, et cetera, and tried to write it in, in an engaging journalistic style because I, I fancy myself a journalist on my good moments. And that, of course, didn't, for a variety of reasons, probably not least of which it was badly written as I reread the drafts today, um, it didn't get a great response. So I thought, well, how do you fix it? You make it longer. And you put more into it. So the book got twice as long, which was just ludicrous in length. And I shopped that around. And then I was told that it still, that didn't fix it. More of bad writing was not going to fix things. And so then I decided that because I was supposedly, a, a think, at that time, a, a, a think tank policy guy, I needed to make it academic. So I found myself a theoretical methodology and framework that would allow me to you know, in, look at the events that had transpired in this country through the prism of crises. And there is some studies and some literatures on crisis. And I shopped that around, and I found that, interestingly enough, that the academic presses in the United States really weren't interested in an academic book of that nature about Japan. But they were interested in a good study of Japan, contemporary Japan, that kind of laid out and explained where the country was and where it was going. So I scraped all the academic theorizing out, which frankly didn't bother me a great deal to begin with, and then came up with a, the book that you see here, drafted that, updated it as we went through the final revisions process, and there you have it. And so this was finished, it takes it up to about the summer of last year, I believe, and then after that it's just the slow, methodical, evolutionary, grinding process of publication. And the book came out April the 1st. And I'm actually relatively pleased with it. As I wrote the book, um, I had sort of two kind of guiding principles in, in, in the way that I wanted to look at and explain what was going on. The first was I didn't want to talk to Westerners about Japan. I wanted this to be the explanation of Japan by Japanese. So while you know, in the sourcing, when as I did my research and I was trying to dig through other stuff on the internet, I've got some, some, some names that you probably all know and, and, and should respect. Um, but the people that I spoke to, and I spoke to several hundred over the course of a, a fairly long period of time, were all Japanese. But what I also tried to do is I tried to make it different kinds of folks. So it's not, this is not, while I am, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a strategic thinker, and I work on foreign policy, and I talk to important people all the time, this is not a book that just reflects their attitudes. My feeling was is that you had to get out and you had to talk to all sorts of Japanese. You needed to talk to business people. You needed to talk to civil society activists. You needed to talk to NGO types. You needed to talk to artists. And those were some really fun conversations. The best conversations I had, though, were with students. I conducted five roundtables at different universities in, all across Japan. And that was the other piece of the book that was fun, is I got out of Tokyo. I wanted to make sure that I was giving you know, views or giving voice to the views about this country that were not the usual suspects. So I spent a lot of time in Osaka and Kyoto and Fukuoka. I went to Okinawa several times and made it a point of being as, as opportunistic as I could about having conversations with as many different people as possible. And I went way out of my comfort zone, which you can probably tell when I probably discuss some issues for which I'm not necessarily expert. But I was relying on the judgments and the opinions of the people that I talked to. And it was a lot of fun. And I think that one of the reasons that, to the degree that my conclusions and my outlook in the book are different from so much of the literature about Japan today, and there's really interestingly enough, after what seemed to me to be a very long dry spell, right now there's some really good books about Japan coming out. They tend to be fairly focused, I think, on the policy stuff. But you don't get a lot of the views, I think, of just ordinary Japanese or of well-informed and spoken to or well-spoken Japanese that aren't necessarily, you know, the guy you show you go to people or the folks in the Kante or the regular politicians. I've got some of those. But I've hopefully got that leavened by a larger cross sections of views that allow me, I think, to reach some conclusions that are a little bit different from so much of the rest of the literature. So that's the background. Then the book itself is structured fairly conventionally. You know, first I I um, I give you a history of Japan from the Meiji era up to essentially 2007 to 2008, trying to understand, has Japan in fact experienced, you know, what, you know what's the, the arcs and the curves of that history? Has Japan in fact experienced a lost decade or two lost decades? And I think we can debate whether there's a plural that belongs at the end of that or whether at least if it's only the 90s or in fact we can sort of credit the, the first decade of the new millennium as a lost 
decade as well. And, and that's, I think that's debatable. And, and uh, it sort of depends, I suppose, on how charitable you want to be about politics and economics in the country. Then I look at what I consider to be four the shokus. Starting in 2007 and 8, you've got the Lehman Shoku, which I use as the opportunity to look at, to, to explore the economics of the country, the economic systems, and the economic problems that it has. Then the next chapter is 2009, you've got the, um, the Seiji Shoku, which is when Minshto comes to power, and you have the end of LDP, LDP rule. And that is the opportunity for me to look at the political system and the political problems that Japan encounters. Then in 2010, you had the Senkaku Shoku. You can tell I'm big, I'm big on alliteration, which um, I happen to like. It's, it's, a, it's a bad habit. And I use that as the excuse. You know, of course, you, I, I presume you're all familiar with the Senkakus, right? The, the island dispute between the Japanese and the Chinese in the East China Sea. And I use that as an opportunity to explore Japan's foreign policy and its relationship with its neighbors and the rest of the world and the degree to which that is a problem for Japan. And then finally, the fourth shoku is the actual jolt of the March 11th uh, Great East Japan earthquake. And I use that to look at issues of national identity, of technology, of the sense of who the Japanese are, how they see themselves in the world, the larger questions of culture and society. So, you know, it, 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 weirdly enough, it works out kind of, it, it's, it's cute as a framework, but it works, right? You've got four shocks that allow you to explore all of the, the issues, I think, in, the important issues in this society. Then I turn to Mr. Abe's return, the Abe uh, uh, Rideau, as he comes back, the brilliant second act in Japanese politics, try to quickly explain through each of the prisms, each of those four particular windows, how the Abe interregnum has worked out, and then how we would judge it, how, the, how not only what does he do, but how, in fact, I think we should interpret it given the past, and the degree to which he's been able to overcome some of the problems that this country has faced, and then the degree to which you know, it allows us to, to make judgments about Japan. And then the final chapter is Peak Japan, and why I've come to the conclusion that I do. And what are those conclusions, you ask? Glad you asked. I mean, the answer is really fairly simple, Peak Japan. I think this is as good as it gets for this country. This is the apogee of Japanese power and influence in the world. With the caveat, I think, that, that one needs to make, that it you know, assumes that the rest in the external environment stays largely the same as it does. I can give you some wild cards, some uh, uh, you know, discontinuities in ways that Japan changes. But to the degree that the larger external framework and the internal dynamics of this country remain what they are, it seems to me that everything from Japan is pretty much downhill from here. Now, I don't know if that downhill goes like this and it's nice and smooth as it's been going for the last decade or so, or two decades, or if it's going to be like this and then precipitously drop off. I leave that to the economists and quite frankly, all the ones I speak to, none of them give me a particularly good answer or consistent answer. There's a whole lot of good reasons to think that Japan could fall off a cliff and there's always good reasons to think that Japan will continue in exactly as it, is, as it is, which is in my mind, one of the great cities of the world to live in and a wonderful country to inhabit. And I think it's important, I want to make sure that this is clear, just because I say that this is peak Japan, I am not necessarily, if you will, a pessimist. This is not a dark vision of this country. I think this is an extraordinary place to live, as you all know. It's an incredibly rich culture, rich society, and it's, I mean, my favorite metric these days is Michelin stars. And the last I checked, Japan, or Tokyo, has, is the number one city with Michelin stars in the world, 300 and 14, I believe it is. Anybody know what number two is? Well, pardon me? France? Yeah, well, city, give me a city, come on. Paris, Paris is number two. Anybody know what number three is? Paris is 141. Number three? Osaka. Osaka. Number four? Kyoto. Kyoto, that's right. Those three cities, three of the top four, and, and give that man a prize. Um, He's just making it up, sure, it, it, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, three of the top four cities of the world with three times as many Michelin stars as Paris are all in Japan. That doesn't strike me as a country in decline in a lot of ways. It's, it's a nice place to spend your time. But I mean, it, it's important to understand the complexities of where this country is. And I, I, I don't want anyone to sort of um, misjudge the conclusions that I reach. And that, that takes on, I want you to keep that caveat in mind when I get to the very end because there's a, another important caveat there, there as well. So, if it's all downhill from here, you know, what's going on? 
And my answer is the way that, I, uh, that, that became evident from the research and evident from the, from the work on the book was just that you know, Japan has, for good reasons and bad, and you can pick both of them, this is a country that's just really set in its ways. It is a country that I like to characterize as small c conservative. It is a country that is extremely risk averse. And for all sorts of different reasons, and I'll elucidate a few of them in a minute, it's a country that is just not in a position to make the changes that are required to keep pace with the changes in the world. And that's not to say that Japan is not changing. I am not saying that at all. I first got here in 1991, and the changes in this city are extraordinary. And I know there are several other folks in this room that have been here even longer than I. And you can, I mean, I remember when I got here, you know, the only cafe that I could think of where I could go have a coffee and pretend that I was, just, just nurture the fantasy that I was in Europe was in Amote Sandodori. And there was, a, there was on, the, on the, the corner of Meiji and, and, and Amote Sando, there was one cafe, which I've forgotten the name. That was it. Nobody, nobody believed in leisure in those days in this country. And now, Tokyo is a city of, that is rich in leisure. It is an extraordinary place. It, is, it, it has uh, no society, and certainly this one, is not stuck in amber. It is a society that changes. But it's not changing fast enough. And the things that have to change more broadly, the big picture stuff, that's got to change to allow Japan to keep pace with a world that is really racing ahead. Those things are not going to happen for a bunch of reasons. And let me now I get to sort of the meat of this stuff. I mean, there's, of course, there are structural problems that drag the Japanese down. And these are fairly conventional, right? You've got debt, the most indebted country of any industrialized society, 240% of GDP, 280, take your pick. That's a heavy burden. Second, on top of that, which is crippling, is the demographic pyramid. And that, that undercuts Japan's future and prospects in so many different ways. But just on the, I mean, for the labor economists up here in, the, in our second row who can explain to this to you better than I can, you know, you know it's what you have when you have a country, the oldest, grayest society in the world, you don't have, have the opportunity, and you don't have the, the innovation, you don't have the vitality, you don't have the dynamism, and you sure as hell don't have the people paying into the pension system to be able to support their retirees. And Japan's inability and reluctance, you know, and, and take your pick on which of those verbs is correct, but the fact of Japan's inverted demographic pyramid is crippling the country's prospects on so many different ways whether we talk about its economic, you know, the future of the economy, whether it talks about its national security, you know, the choices that the government is going to have to make, right, you know, to, to, to pay for social services and to pay for all the burden. Right now, we are having Sturm and Drang about an eight, a uh, 2% increase in the consumption tax, right, from 8 to 10%, and we're not sure what's going to happen with that. The OECD rec re estimates or reckons it's going to be about 25 or 28% is what's actually required if this country is going to be uh, solvent in the future. You know, or typically, the argument is made that governments have to choose between guns and butter, right? This government, given the nature of the world around it, given its ambitions, is going to have to choose, however, between guns and wheelchairs, because that's what its population is going to be demanding. Is not only does it get older, but we reach an age of super longevity, and we have an, an elderly society that is going to demand services, is going to demand resources, and is just going to be, I hate to use the word drag, but it's going to be sucking more resources out of the society than it's going to be putting back in. And that's just a fact of life. And there are ways that you can change that to adjust it, but it strikes me that those are only on the margins. The big questions about economic vitality, about the ability of this country to remain deeply, deeply engaged in a dynamic global economy, the, that's not possible, quite frankly, when you're mostly, when, when your society is as old as Japan is going to be. So those are, but those are the structural reasons, and those are the easy ones. Now, let me, I think the more interesting set of issues are the attitudinal constraints, or cultural and philosophical. And this is where I have the most fun in the book. And this is where I'd be most interested to hear some of your thoughts. So there is generally this notion of Japan being risk averse and small c conservative. And where does, how does that manifest? Well, crude and simple way, I mean, the Japanese, rightfully so, I think, have great pride in having created a unique economic model that did extraordinary things. 
If you think about the successes of this country in the 60s and 70s and 80s, before the bubble burst, it's quite remarkable. With what they had and what they did, the Japanese are rightly proud of having created this unique form of capitalism. And in their reluctance, I think, on one level, to alter that because other folks say they should, I think there's under understandable reluctance and a reticence about doing that. Similarly, quite frankly, the model of capitalism that they constructed, not only does it work well, but it's well suited to this society. It fits the Japanese people. So it seems, again, kind of doubly difficult to believe that they might give that up merely in the name of some uncertain rewards. And that brings me to the third attitudinal issue, which is in a small c conservative risk averse society, you can't promise the folks here that the changes that they need to make in their country to their political economy, et cetera, are going to provide them with better lives, better opportunities, better outcomes than what they've got. Things here are pretty damn good. And while, yes, you need perhaps to unleash innovation, and you've got to foster creativity, and you've got to create mobility, what you really have got to do is pull down a great deal of the society, pull down a lot of the structures that have existed, and that takes a great deal of courage and a great deal of risk because you have absolutely no guarantee and no certainty that the outcomes are going to necessarily be any better than the ones they have now. And you know, if you're Japanese and you're looking at what's going on in the rest of the world, you look at the United States, perhaps you look at certain countries in England, and it's kind of difficult to say that those are necessarily better choices and better options, that it makes more sense for you as a Japanese to abandon or give up what you've got and alter it in the name of somebody else's model. So all those strike me as being fairly reasonable reasons to be, if you will, averse to change. Then there are, I suppose, some fairly mundane, what I like to think of banal explanations for aversion. And for this, I thank Tag for his book, The Shackles of History. You know, you talk about vested interests and you talk about the Iron Triangle, right? When I, it was that great line of yours, you say something where um, elites don't commit suicide. Right? They don't, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is to make the changes that are required to ad make Japan more adaptable to the future and the world in which we live requires people in power to pretty much give up what they've got, and that's generally not what they do. I think that's banal, but I also think it's a fairly powerful explanation. And you can see that in politics, you see it in economics, you see it in business, you see it throughout this society. Um, then there is the fact that you have and this I think is kind of an interesting argument, that the Japanese in many ways are wedded to institutions and structures of the international system that are in fact declining in power and influence, right? They're a charter member of the G7. They are the US's most important ally in the United States. And the fact of the matter is, both of those institutions are weakening in international influence and status. I'm not happy about the second one, but I think it's a fair statement. That's not necessarily fatal. But the fact of the matter is we're seeing the rise of alternative structures of power, the G20, that we can talk about China's attempts to, to create alternative models of governance or alternative institutions. But the Japanese are vested or have a stake, a powerful stake, in institutions that are being degraded relative to others. And that too, I think, contributes to their you know, relative diminution in status and influence in the world. Um, to return to a note I said before, as one of my uh, interviewees said, I live in a country that's comfortable, rich, and beautiful. This is a, a, a young woman. And you know, <laughs> the, only Tokyo, the only Japan I've known is a country that has been in decline. But, but Tokyo is comfortable, rich, and beautiful, so it's very difficult for me to complain. That attitude is very widespread, especially among the young. Again, like I said, some of the interviews with young people were some of the most fascinating conversations that I had. And you look at the young people in Japan, and quite frankly, nothing personal, guys, you're not very hungry. There isn't a great drive to compete. I've had young Japanese tell me that they would compare themselves to their Korean and Chinese friends, and they just felt like, you know, just don't have to work that hard. That they like what they've got. Again, you know, this notion of we have a society that as one woman said, I can travel on the train at any hour of the night. I can walk home in any neighborhood and it's safe. What's wrong with that? I watched my parents and my grandparents work and make sacrifices in the name of some larger national good. They're no happier than I am. I'm not prepared to make those sacrifices. I heard that repeatedly from all sorts of young people in this country. There isn't that hunger. 
And to be honest, they don't need to have that hunger either. Again, go back to a society with an inverted pyramid, it's a demographic pyramid. You have a shrinking number of jobs. Fascinating, this took me a while to figure out. You know, if you wanna have a future in Japan, the best thing you should do is not screw up. So what it does is it encourages you as a young person to take no risk, to, make, to keep your head down, to not do anything that might otherwise prejudice or otherwise undermine your future. And I, again, I, for this I would credit some of the insights from my, um, my friend Masaru Tamamoto back there, who notes that you know, the Japanese are very good about sticking together. It's a peasant society, as he likes to say, and where no one is going to have the courage to, to change it, to make the, 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 the drastic changes. I think he, at one point he talks about how we need a Gorbachev, someone who has the courage to pull the system down. There's no need for that. And the young people in this country are not prepared to take those risks and are not prepared to take that step. And that too, I think, if you will, squelches the appetite for reform and squelches the, the prospect, the initiative here. Then you have a philosophy of Mujo, for example, Buddhist philosophy that talks about pacifism, or not pacifism, I'm sorry, but pacifism and quietism of the, if you will, the evanescence of the human experience. One that says that we should accept what comes to us. And thus, it really doesn't make a great deal, it makes sense philosophically as a way of life, of straining, if you will, to try to change and compete and to, to fight against the inevitable ebbs and flows of history and human nature, and human tide and human events. And then there is the cultural values here of, of WA. I had several people actually talk about WA, right? That we need to all get along harmoniously. One, one notable foreign, uh, uh, diplomat and scholar once said that, you know, if we ever rewrite or write our own Japanese constitution, the very first sentence in that constitution should be, Japan is a country of wa and harmony. That's how powerful that notion is. But you include wa and you include this notion of gambaru, of stoicism, of this idea that we all need to fit together, that we don't make waves, that we don't, the nails, you know, nails that are getting stuck up, we don't, we don't stick that nail up. We don't stick our heads up. We don't cause trouble. And all of those are means to make change. All of this creates, I think, a powerful, powerful pressure to you know, mute whatever tensions that might exist and whatever impetus there may be for change in the society. I had a politician who is fairly senior right now, and I'll, I won't tell you who he is just because then you won't buy my book, um, who says you know, our resilience, our, you know, the stoicism, the things for which we were applauded, after the 311, you know, if, as you recall, after the March 11 uh, uh, triple catastrophe, people were there, were, there was extraordinary reporting about how orderly the Japanese were. That in the face of this incredible tragedy and pain that they endured, and that they did not, there was no, there was no chaos. And it was so controlled. And I, I, a, a, a one woman I, who uh, has since went on to organize a number of the Matsuri in some of the affected communities because they've realized the value of culture of tying these communities together and acting as a balm, right? Her comment was, well, of course, how can, we, we shouldn't be applauded for that. That's who we are. This is our society. This is the nature of being Japan, are people that deal with adversity in, in this you know, calm, collected, and, and, and peaceful way. And then this politician was discussing it, and his comment was, you know, our resilience is an absolute break on change. And he's right. It is precisely that cultural pressure that drains and leeches, if you will, in so many ways, the tension out of the society and ensures that Japan will not be making the adjustments that perhaps it could and should be making. I'm almost done. Um, actually, that's almost it. Finally, the implications for, seem to me, that, that draw out of this, this study. And to be honest, unlike in a, the last book I wrote, I devoted a chapter to Things that should, you know, it was about Japan and South Korea and the things that they should be doing to solve the problems in their relationship. And I didn't feel as though it was time, we should do that in this book for a number of reasons. The first was that there's probably nothing that I can contribute to this discussion that hasn't already been laid on the table. And that, I think, is one of the really interesting kind of uh, insights that feeds so much of my analysis, which is the fact that 
For example, of demographic crises, you can go back to the 1970s and Japanese demographers are already pointing out the fact that their society is in trouble. I was just reading a study, a, a book of uh, Richard McGregor's book of Japan-China relations. And he talks about when Kakuei Tanaka was meeting Deng Xiaoping in Beijing in the 1970s. He was joking about how you don't have to worry too much about the Japanese because in a couple of hundred years we will disappear because we won't have any of us left. I mean, the idea that, there, that I am going to provide any insight that the Japanese themselves have not offered or cannot offer on any of these, these problems is silly. But the implication of that is, is that the Japanese have been well aware of the problems that their country faces, and yet they've refused to make the changes to deal with them. And at some point, eventually, even I figured out, not making a choice is a type of choice. Allowing these tensions to persist in your society, for example, continuing to treat women as the Japanese have traditionally done in ways that limit their choices is a way of, by not changing the policies and not changing the opportunities, is a way of telling the world where your priorities actually lie. And so the fact that, the, you know, the fact that we have these problems is a precise recognition of the fact that the Japanese have certain cultural preferences, value preferences, policy preferences, and they're, going, they're happy and they prefer those to the outcomes that might come that would result if they change them. So the bottom line is there are not a lot of policy prescriptions in here. If somebody wants me to write another book like that, I'm happy to. But at this point, I thought I, I got my funder got his money's worth from what I gave you. Second, um, and this was the important thing that I really wanted to point out in the book. I'm, a, I'm a, a huge fan of this country, and it's been very good to me, and I enjoy living here. I've moved back here after 17, 18 years away, so I think I've made you know, a statement about my commitments. And yet, I'm very concerned about the gap that exists between the perception of Japan in the world, particularly in the world in which I spend my time, this intellectual, this world of foreign policy and foreign strategy, you know, strategic relations and stuff, that in that world, there is a sense that this government in this country is capable of doing far more than it will. And that, to me, is the real danger. That there will be a mistaken identity, or a mistaken sense that the values and the preferences, the sacrifices, the notion of statehood and national purpose that the Abe government represents is actually represented more broadly in the society. And I don't think that's true. I think that the, 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 the evidence in the book suggests that is not the case. And that, too, is a reason why this is the apogee of Japanese power. But the fear that I have is that folks in Washington don't understand that. And thus, we will find ourselves in a crisis at some point where the United States will be looking at Japan and seeing and having expectations that are tempered precisely by the Abe experience. And in the absence of that, we will have a real crisis and a real rupture. And if you believe, as I do, that this relationship is so important, you have to do everything you can to head that off in advance, that, that rupture. And that's what this book is, in, is, is um, intended to do. So, you know, I believe in this partnership, and I believe, you know, the great things that this country is capable of doing and that we can do with the United States and, frankly, with other allies and partners in Australia and South Korea, if you guys can ever work that out, uh, other countries elsewhere, that there are important things to be done, but they are only possible with an understanding, an accurate assessment, an understanding of the place that Japan occupies in the world today, the forces that are at work on the society, the politics, et cetera. And that's the book. Thanks, thanks a lot, Brad. This was exactly what we wanted. And as you see, the crowd applauded. Uh, just one comment and one question. You know, my understanding is also that at the first meeting between the late Prime Minister Tanaka and Chu Enlai, uh, Tanaka offered apologies for Japan's actions during the 1930s and 40s. And uh, Chu Enlai said, oh, don't apologize. I got a job thanks to the Japanese army because you destroyed the Kuomintang. <laughs> I didn't. Um, but this, the, my question will be, you talked about this war thing. Isn't this kind of a very recent quote unquote tradition? Because if you think of Meiji, it's pretty violent. I mean. One of the main causes of death of Japanese politicians is assassination. Now, ass assassination is consensual in the sense that post-assassination you have consensus, but it's not very war. You know, 226, uh, I mean, you have a lot of, and even in the 50s, uh, labor management relations are very violent, the Mine strike. Uh, so isn't this war just maybe 
a stage of Japanese history, but something that isn't a core element of Japanese society? Um, clearly, you're a victim of false consciousness, Robert. Um, um, I, you know, it's very tricky. We were having dinner a couple of hours ago, and we were talking about you know, patterns of labor policy in the Taisho era, and I was telling Robert that I thought that was completely manipulated and artificial, and how remarkable it is that over a hundred, you know, you can, you know, we, 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 the Japanese have created this mythology of these traditions, and now he's throwing it back in my face, so that's not very cute, Robert, and I'm going to remember this the next time it's your birthday. Um, no, I, obviously there are, all of the generalizations is all you want to say. The generalizations are true in general, and they're not true in particular. So you can always identify, I think, these particular moments in history and these incidents as well. But, yeah, uh, all of these myths are artificial and created, and, and, but nonetheless, that doesn't mean they're not powerful, they're not believed. And there will be people, I mean, Yukio Mishima tried to you know, create his own little moment, right, on top of the, the defense agency building. And, and tried to, to raise the people up, and I guess they all decided at that time that they would prefer to be wash than, than, than whatever he was offering them. I think th there is, clearly, there have been moments in this country's history when it has this changed course, 1853, 1945. What seems to be the case is, is that at this moment, the Japanese are sufficiently agent-ish, right, in terms of their own ability to act and, and create their own futures, except when they're utterly devastated and feel utterly under the hand of an external impulse that they cannot refute or deny. And that's what it takes to bring about that sort of substantial change. But I think in the general sense of the word, that the society has become acceptance of those notions and that there isn't sufficient rationale for them to abandon them. So they're happy to believe, this may be a myth and it may be an artificially constructed, you know, all of these identity tropes are constructed. Winners write the narratives, but they're happy with that narrative. There isn't sufficient pain as yet strikes me to want to do something else. So I'm David Johnson. I'm a professor of sociology at the University of Hawaii, and I've done research about Japan for a while. Um, I think you need to speak more closely in the mic. Uh, yeah, and thank you for your talk. It's in nice. In Honolulu? University of Hawaii, Honolulu? Uh, in Manoa, yeah. Oh, I've yeah. yeah. frequented it. So um, um, thank you for your talk. It's nice to have talks like this in Tokyo. And I want to point at two parts of your talk that I will say, I, I, I want to be good spirited about this, that, that, that make me not want to buy your book. Two parts of the talk, if I may. Um, one part of the book, it, in the beginning when you're framing the talk, mm -hmm. you said, uh, this is peak Japan, this is as good as it gets, Japan's at its apogee, and then a few sentences later you said, uh, here, here, hereafter, everything will go downhill. But then you said later, you're not a pessimist about Japan. And I don't know about you, but to me, someone who says this is as good as it's get and everything's gonna go downhill is by definition a pessimist. So I just, I just see a, an oxymoron there in your claims, and I wonder if you'd like to, uh, to try to, to harmonize them. Okay. Similarly, um, when you said that Japan is set in its ways, um, I mean, to be set in your ways means you're not gonna change. But then a sentence or two later, you said Japan is not changing. Um, and, and, okay, and so you illustrated the first point, but then a little bit later you said, well, I don't wanna say that Japan doesn't change. And so again, it's like, yeah, I, I hear you saying A and not A, but I don't hear you harmonizing them. And I'd like to see how you do that. So that's my first cluster of concerns. It has to do with apparent contradictions in your claims, in okay. your most general claims. Okay. And then my second um, um, point where I'd push a bit is, um, is the premise of the talk, and apparently the premise of the book, which I have not read, which is that Japan needs to change. Okay? So let me, let me, say, let me say three things about that. Premises. One is, that's a, that's a statement you can say about any country, surely. America needs to change. Germany needs to change, South Korea needs to change, et cetera. And if you just think about the United States where you and I are from, you know, I mean, think about the problems, you know, race, violent crime, you know, a political part, a political system that's so bifurcated that it's dysfunctional and incapable of governing effectively, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, 
you can make just the same argument about, about the United States. Mm -hmm. So at one level, the claim that Japan needs to change doesn't sound all that interesting to me because it's just true about every place. And then the second thing I would say is, um, by the way, Japan is changing in a lot of ways. And so I'm a student of law, and in the last 10 years or 15 years, Japan's had an enormous amount of legal change, an enormous amount of legal change. And so um, uh, I, I, I don't know how you, how you fit that into your, your scheme. And then the third thing is about this, and, th and then I'll sit down and shut up. I realize this is a bit of a ramble, but okay. you, at least I'm taking you seriously, right? So, You'll learn that's a mistake. But that's okay. So um, if, if your claim is Japan needs to change, what I want to know is how and why. And you didn't, you didn't say much about that. I want, to know how, I want to know why Japan needs to change, and I want to know how it needs to change. And the why question, at the end, you talked about women, and I'm with you there. I'm with you there. But I'd like to know, like, more precisely how Japan needs to change. And I'd like to know um, why. And, and at the very end of your talk, when you talked about the need to, to maintain the U.S.-Japan relationship, I, I don't know, that strikes me as, as, as a way of, of not changing. Because Japan's deep dependence on the United States is surely an impediment to changing in all sorts of ways related to international relations and foreign affairs and so on. So, you know, I said, I don't know, six or 16 things. You can choose as many as you want sure. to talk about. No, yeah. and, and no. I... And thank you. Thank you for... Well, and I appreciate the questions. Um, no, and, and they're good points. They're hopelessly wrong-headed, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> and they're actually all kind of folding in on each other. They're about whether Japan is changing, whether Japan should change, and what would be a good way to change? And I think, I thought I was clear. Number one, I mean, I, I, one of my key takeaways, or one of the things I would definitely say, of course, is Japan is changing. Like I said, no society is stuck in amber. Uh, 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 my turn. Um, <laughs> I've got the mic. I paid for this microphone. Um, that, no, no, I mean, it's a fair question. My point would be that Japan is changing, and as I said, but it's not changing in ways that allow it to keep pace with the world. Stop. So I concede change, and I like change, and, but, but let's also be very clear. One of the things I want to make sure of is, is that the, I am trying really hard, really hard, not to judge this country. And that, for an American, is really hard to do. And it's hard to do, among other things, because, you know, it is so difficult for us, as you rightly note, to criticize anybody these days, given what's going on in our country. And I'm not being a critic here. I'm trying to be descriptive. Because the argument that I'm trying to make is, is that, one, the Japanese have a country, you know, and it sounds so weird when I say it, the Japanese, you Japanese have a country you like. The Japanese have a country that they have constructed a society that works for them, and that's great. And as long as they are comfortable with it, then that's all that matters. I am not making a judgment about what should be done here. What I'm trying to, what I want to suggest, however, is that there is a mismatch between the ambitions of the leadership, the current leadership in this country, and its potential over the long run. And that if this government stays in power, and if the view of this government continues, that that gap will widen between the potentials and capabilities of this nation and what it actually can deliver. And the gap between, I'm sorry, between those ambitions and that reality. That, to me, is the critical issue here. This is a country, however, that has, I think, done, you know, great stuff, and is the people within it precisely because Every, by almost every indicator, the Japanese people are content with what they have and are not prepared to embrace the structural and systemic changes that need to be done to realize those ambitions. Not to have a great, wonderfully clean, efficient economy. Not to have one of the safest places in the world. Not to have all of those Michelin star restaurants. By those metrics, this is an incredibly successful place. By other metrics, however, it is not. That, to me, is the key of all of this. And the Japanese, I'm sorry, to, I'm trying to get back to your exact question. You know, I'm not a pessimist because it is 
Japan at this moment is a peak, as I put it, in terms of its international power and influence. And as a strategist, a foreign affairs person, someone whose prism is, you know, who looks at the country traditionally through the prism of its leadership and its foreign policy and its goals and this notion of comprehensive national power, that's the peak that I am referring to. Now, I can understand ways in which Japan could maximize its power and influence in the world that would require either drastic changes in the society that might not produce the changes they want or changes in the goals that they choose to achieve. In which case, you still could have this trajectory continue and the Japanese, for example, abandoning this notion of constitutional revision and genuinely embracing soft power as a modality for international leadership. But that ain't what this government wants to do. That's my point. And I'm not making judgments about what's right or wrong because it's not for me to judge, truly. I'm saying it has to change if, it's not, if it wishes to close the gap between the leadership's international ambitions and what the country is capable of doing. That's all. Again, in the nature of the international system in which we inhabit, in which this leadership prefers to operate, it is not able to do what it says it wants to do. And over time, that creates a risk for this country, I think, because of expectations that will be placed upon it. Now, to go back to your other point about the U.S.-Japan alliance, I happen to think that that's a really great, you know, that the alliance is an extraordinary good. I also argue in the book and also believe that Japan has over relied on the alliance in many ways. And that the most important, one of the most important foreign policy objectives that any Japanese government has to do is to revisit Datsua, to recreate a, a relationship with Asia. Now, we can go back to the Hatoyama years, and this is a politically loaded statement, and I'm prepared to say that Hatoyama may be onto something with UI. And he may have been onto something with his attempts to forge a different type of relationship with Beijing. He failed for a bunch of different reasons, but it is possible, and it is likely, that this reassessment of Japan's relationship in that triangular relationship between Asia and the West, that needs to be reconfigured. I don't think it has to come. It's not zero sum and does not have to come at the expense of the United States. But yeah, that's part of it. And I think, you know, you're on to something there. But as for the contradictions, I think that is, quite frankly, you know, there's easy, I, I, I don't see them. I think that's kind of, you know, you're plucking phrases out without understanding the larger intellectual, you know, the, the arguments that I'm making here. And so, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe a beer or a wine or something or sake is going to be the best way to work that one out. Um, another question. There's a lot of them. Um, let's try to yeah keep them short because I want to have some fun. Hi, thank you very much. And uh, I'm a basically economist, so I stick to my question uh, on the economics policy. And uh, uh, when we discuss the history of Japan after the Second World War, we have to answer three questions. One is why Japan was so successful up to the end of the 1980s. And question is, Japan may be uh, excellent. Japanese are excellent. And the uh, second question is, then why Japanese after 1990 was so nonsense? You mean, uh, 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 because Japanese become suddenly so lazy, you see. That's a simple question. But uh, you have to explain both difficult questions. Why such these Japanese, to some point, become so, oh, how do you say, uh, passive or uh, unsuccessful afterward? And uh, so that's, this is the most important question. What are the major factors that change uh, uh, Japanese or Japanese uh, government? And uh, in your book, uh, you explain uh, several things. But uh, I, want I want the quite simple answer. What makes Japanese so different between uh, in the peak of 1990 or something? That's my first question. And second question, you say that in Tokyo, this is such a comfortable, rich uh, uh, city. 
Yes, but if you look at the countryside, already is a, uh, that's a dreadful situation. That's why the government of Japan is so eager to uh, fill, uh, de reduce the gap between uh, urban and rural, rural, rural area. Sorry. And even Tokyo, it's a peak because the uh, speed of aging is so rapid in Tokyo. And uh, for example, uh, one third of the uh, uh, increase of the population after age 75 took place in Tokyo metropolitan area. It's natural because young, uh, young people are flowing into Tokyo for many years. That's why the aging of Tokyo is so rapid. So actually what you see, the prosperity in Tokyo is just, uh, it's in a sense uh, de declining more rapidly than the average Japan. So why we, we should change, as Professor uh, uh, Johnson said, that because nobody wants that. And because uh, they say that it's a, because of the silver economy, because of the egoism of the elderly people, they sacrifice the younger people. That's not the truth, because I'm one of the older population, older generation, we never want that. But because of the lack of information, Particularly, it's a fault of the journalist. Japanese journalists never say the truth. They simply appeal to the people. And because of the misinformation, Japanese people are misguided. So my policy suggestion is journalists should change, or let the journalists change. And do you agree with, uh, with me or not? That's my final question. Thank you very much. As a former journalist, I'm going to take issue with that. Um, we should rewrite Shakespeare. First, kill all the journalists. Um, first of all, I mean, it seems to me that I can take your second question and put it against Professor Johnson's question, and I've got an answer as to why Japan should change. Um, so it strikes me that you're making my case for that there are deep and structural problems in this economy. You're just blaming the journalists for it, which I find a bit odd. I mean, um, journalists can be faulted for a lot, but that's not, I don't think that's the, the thing that I would fault them for the most. Um, but I want to start, I think, with your your first question about, you know, what, what, what changed? Well, the global economy changed. I mean, that's, that's the biggest shift. What happened in Japan was that you had the end of the Cold War, you had the unleashing of market forces in the rest of the world, and the, enter of China into, the entrance of China into the global economy and the creation of the information post-industrial society that utterly, utterly transformed the nature of the, the, the capitalist system. And I think that that's, that more than anything else is what screwed Japan up. I mean, I remember back in the 90s, early 90s being here, and talking to friends of mine, industrialists, big industrialists, and, you know, and asking them questions like, you know, why are you guys being so slow to adjust, to, to addressing your, particularly the problems in your financial institutions? And the answer was, well, you Americans, it took you seven, eight years to clean up the savings and loan crisis, which, was, as you recall, was the previous decade. To which my answer was, yes, and you're supposed to learn from our mistakes. Right? You're not supposed to just kind of keep doing the same dumb things that we did. And I think there was a belief at that time that the Japanese felt, again, given the, the, the pride and, and, and the, the economic model, et cetera, there was a belief that the pendulum had swung. The 80s had been Japan's years, the 90s were going to be America's years, and then the pendulum would swing back again. And that's not what happened. The pendulum broke. It swung in one direction and then collapsed. The, the nature of the entire international, you know, Political economy changed, and the Japanese were not prepared for that. And I would argue in many ways the society is not prepared for that. The nature of the education system, the press on innovation, the degree to which manufacturing, which is so, so critical to the, you know, to, to the, the Japanese economy, all of those you know, uh, features eroded. All those comparative advantages vanished. And in so many different ways, the Japanese are struggling to catch up with that. And that strikes me as the bigger question. Right, but, I, but, but, ni but globalization in the 80s and globalization in the 90s are two very, very, very different things. And globalization in the 2000s is even more different. I mean, there's one thing about internationalizing your supply chains. There's another thing about having the absolute bottom drop out of the labor market and the discovery, of course, that all of these things, all these products, you know, that, 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 that process technology, this whole process, the, 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 the creation and the, and the focus on, 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 on you know, maximizing process technology isn't necessarily where the real competitive advantage or, or where long-term cost advantage lies. 
I just think that that larger structural shift, you know, the entry of China, the end of the Cold War, the victory of capitalism, whatever you want to have it, all of that together in combination with the development of information technologies just so transformed the economy, the Japanese are just not prepared for that. I mean, Robert talks about it when he discusses Galapagos syndrome here, right? That too, I think, contributes to a great deal of it. This notion, the Japanese have always believed in many ways that, you know, their, their country was impenetrable on so many levels that it was so distinct and, so, you know, wari wari nihonjin. And I think that in many ways that's just not true. That in, in important ways, Japan has proven porous, and in important other ways it's proven to be just as sol solid, the, the barriers between it and the rest of the world. And that's what contributes, I think, to all of that. The guy next to the microphone just to, to save the walk. Thanks, uh, Rado. Richard Sammons from TUJ. Uh, I was wondering if your book says much about the immigration question, because many countries have changed their approach to immigration. As an Australian, you know, Australia was founded almost on a constitutional settlement on monocultural immigration, only to be shocked into change by being attacked by Japan. So that did it for us. But uh, in Japan, you talk to people and they'll say that, oh, it's essential to Japanese national identity that Japan has its distinctive uh, uniform culture. But it's also important to Japanese identity that Japan is a major country. Uh, you know, a great power, if you'll call it that. So is there, would be there anything to say that if sort of the threat to the latter, if Japan is in decline, would lead to a sense of crisis that would finally lead to some major change on the immigration question? I think the short answer is no. Next question. <laughs> um, no, the answer, first, first of all, I don't really look that much at immigration in the book. I mean, it's obviously, it's, it's one answer to the, to the demographic question, but I mean the Japanese I think have made very clear their preferences about the acceptable levels of immigration. And again, to go back to, to Professor Johnson's question who's left already, I clearly did not make him happy with my answers, um, that you know, the Japanese have changed. Again, the fact, you know, that my presence in this country on the second go-round is an indication of the, of the, the changes in the immigration system. The, the laws that were passed just earlier this year, wasn't it, right? You know, uh, the, that, that's an important change. But the fact of the matter is, when I wrote a, a paper on this 10 years ago, the Medi ex estimates were 400,000 immigrants a year were needed to fill the labor gap. Now there's, what, 6.44 million estimated shortage of labor by 2029, I think it is, or 2030. That, those numbers aren't going to get touched. There's nothing going to come even close to that. So, and again, I think the answers are, you know, there is no doubt that the Japanese are not well aware of what it would take to plug the gaps. And they've chosen not to, to plug them. It's their choice. It's perfectly fine. But there are consequences from that. And you address one of them, the degree to which being a diminished great power status might well influence that. And my judgment, judging from the research and whatever, is that the Japanese are no longer as wedded to great power status as perhaps, you know, certainly Prime Minister Abe is. And thus, you know, you look at it, and, and again, you talk to young people, it's like, why bother? This, it doesn't, we do not see the rewards as commensurate with the, uh, with the effort that we have to make to maintain that particular status. And China, I think, has been really important in this. Insofar as, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I like to liken China to the funhouse mirror. The Japanese look at China and they see a country that has a large population, nuclear weapons, a permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council, second largest economy in the world, growth rates three times that of their own. I mean, yes, there are all those problems with the Chinese. And, and, and you know, we can just make just as long a list that suggests that trajectory will not continue. But nevertheless, the immediate reaction is, look at that. We can't compete with that. And thus, the, the answer is to opt out. It's a choice. But that seems to me where the country is going. I mean, um, I speculated 20 years ago, I wrote a paper that argued that Japan's best future was as the Switzerland of Asia, right? In the, in the, and, but not of the region. And just to be left alone to do its own thing, and that would probably be the best possible option. I think if the Chinese leadership had been as smart as it thought it was in the late 1990s, they might have offered them a deal that would give them that. But they didn't, and now we're in slightly locked in a slightly more uh, we're locked in a somewhat more contentious, uh, contentious relationship. Another guy next to the thing. You're next to the. I'm going with folks next to the. Uh, but we'll uh, get. We'll move up front in yeah. a minute. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I'm, my name is Jonathan Webb. I'm a PhD candidate at Keio University, and I work for the Nippon Institute for Research Advancement. Um, so I want to bring up two points. The first thing you mentioned 
uh, one of the first things you mentioned was how many Japanese young people feel they're very comfortable here and how a senior politician said, you know, our resilience is the primary impediment to change. Many people are listening to what I say. I have to yeah. be careful. Well, and I, that, oh, I've heard a lot of that sentiment in my own experience, but um, nonetheless, uh, the Asia Pacific Institute published a book recently, and, you know, we're struggling to raise the consumption tax to 10%, as you mentioned during your talk, but uh, if the consumption tax is raised in stages, it may need to be raised as high as 35%, right. uh, according to their estimates. Um, and you also mentioned the crushing de government debt. Sooner or later, there has to be a reckoning. And so, sure, uh, Japanese young people may be comfortable today. Uh, sure, Japanese people may be resilient in the face of what appears to be a, well, I shouldn't say what appears to be a major disaster. I was here, it was a major disaster, but not in the sense that the whole country, not in the same way that, for example, um, the challenges Japan faced in the 19th century and the early 20th century were. Um, is it not possible that at some point uh, that comfort is going to go away and that will be a catalyst for change? That's the first thing I wanted to ask. The second thing is just you mentioned a mismatch between um, what you think the U.S. expects of Japan in the foreign policy realm and what it's capable of doing. And I was wondering if you could just uh, elaborate that on that a bit more because that's an area of great interest to me. Thank you. Yeah, typical PhD student want me to do all your work for you, huh? <laughs> I want to thank you in your dissertation, pal. Um, I mean, will a crisis be a catalyst for change? Sure, if it's a big enough crisis. But I mean, by the same token, if it's a big enough crisis, the Japanese are going to turn all their energies inward. They're going to rebuild their country, in which case they go off the board. Right? I mean, if you, you, sure, you can have a big enough shock that makes the Japanese and all the, everybody in the society feel as though they've got to devote themselves to rebuilding Japan. Well, if you're going to rebuild Japan, that means you're not going to be doing all this other stuff anyway. Right? So, you know, you want to be uchi muki? That's going to make you pretty uchi muki for a while. That's inward looking for you folks that don't know. That's a new word for me, so I'm happy. Um, as for the question of the U.S.-Japan alliance, this is an interesting conversation. I was talking to a, a former journalist who's clearly a problem, a troublemaker, according to Sensei. Um, and he was arguing that, in fact, the, the, most folks in Washington are already discounting the Japanese. That the, the, my larger concern about a mismatch in expectations between Japan and the United States is, is a, you know, I shouldn't be worried. I shouldn't lose any sleep over it. But, I mean, my sense, however, is, is that there is this belief that the Japanese are going to be capable of doing more. And there's certainly, I mean, Prime Minister Abe keeps making that case in his cabinet, him more than anyone else. I mean, he's clearly the most articulate supporter. And I mean, part of the political problems I believe that this country faces is, is there aren't any other people that have both his knowledge, his vision, his capacity to mobilize the bureaucracy, that have the circumstances that he has that allows him to have been the dominant political figure of the last seven years. So, you know, but, and, and the question becomes, are the United States prepared to, does the United States understand how Japan will react? Do you, does the U.S. truly understand the dynamics? So, again, while there is a sympathy in Tokyo for a harder, for example, on a policy question, while I think there is great sympathy here for a harder line against China, for all sorts of particularly good reasons, the notion that this country is implacably hostile to China that it is, in fact, a line behind the worst, the most hawkish of the hawks in the White House and the administration is a silly statement. It's not factually correct. China is a geopolitical, geographic reality in Japan. And you talk to anyone here, and they will tell you, while we need to have a hard line, while we need to be, you know, understandably tough about aggressions in the East China Sea, the South China Sea, et cetera, intellectual property theft, go through your list of misbehaviors. At the same time, however, China ain't going away. And we have got to come up with a modus vivendi, and we cannot afford to just have a completely competitive, conflictual relationship that finds no common ground and no room for cooperation. So I think, you know, finding and, and then understanding that basic belief and not misinterpreting it in terms of what the nature of Japanese reliance, reliability, and the degree of alignment with American policy positions, that's a bit of a task. It requires... Uh, Certainly, I think, more nuanced than this particular administration, U.S. administration has demonstrated it's comfortable with. But there's more to it than that. But I think that's the easy way to put it. 
I, well, let me add just one more thing. I think, you know, as you're talking about this, um, uh, the, the, the need to raise the, uh, the consumption tax, I mean, at the same time, Japan is pressing, or be, and certainly being pressed, to spend more on its own defense. And it's doing a very admirable job, but I don't think anybody would say they're remotely close to what they need to be doing to, to, to provide both for their own defense and certainly within the alliance context. And I'm, this is not an argument about host nation support. I think that the Japanese contribute a great deal. But to do what, again, this government would like to do, and what I think more, what alliance advocates would suggest the Japanese need to be doing, will require considerably more spending on the part of the government. And that, again, in these straightened and fiscal circumstances is a long shot, a real long shot. So how will those tensions be resolved and worked out? Um, I'm not, you know, the decline of Japan, I wish it goes slowly because I like it here, but my impression is it's going to go faster. And uh, the reason I say so is uh, I was involved in the semiconductor industry, and uh, Japan had, you know, in the 1980s, about 50% market share. Now it's totally dropped off. It's, you know, game over now. However, in the new industries where I'm now in the, the data market, like AI, like everybody else, but there's clearly a total shortage of AI capable data people. They're not graduating engineers in Japan. I mean, you go to other countries, it's 50% men, 50% women. It's not there. And so when you think about data, it's going to become a big part of the economy, and you don't have the people. What are you going to do? Right? You're going to, uh, I see companies which are moving headquarters to the United States, or like even Toyota doing Toyota research. It's going to hollow out. And so I imagine it's, it's, I'm more pessimist than you are. Um, what, is it, what, what is it going to make? You, you had mentioned when it goes really bad, the Japanese will get together. So, you know, economically, no, you, don't, you don't think so? Well, if it does, do you have any scenarios, one or two scenarios, where things can happen and uh, how, you know, things can recoup, right? I, I agree about the Switzerland, but it, it's not going to happen, right? I mean, if the question is about what is the shock that it's going to take to get the Japanese to change, to reorient, I think the answer is sort of the one I came up with a minute ago, which is that, any shock that's going to be big enough to force change on Japan is going to be such a large shock that it's basically going to take Japan offline for a while, and I mean a good long while. So one way or another, Japan becomes marginal in the global economy for, or in the global power structure for, what, a decade, a generation while it rebuilds. I don't know, you know, the great Nankai trough, you know, the big, the big earthquake, right? And Tokyo is devastated. That's a shock if, if it's the big one, the, the really big one. That does the trick. But then what condition is this country in at that point? I mean, it's, not going, it's going to be rebuilding. And that's going to be a all-consuming task. Japan is not going to be president in the rest of the world when the country is leveled like that. I mean, in many ways you could say that might be a great thing. It distributes power. You know, it, it forces a, a, a reassessment of value. I mean, it, that's one thing. But again, I don't see, it strikes me that a shock of that magnitude, whatever it would be, a war, um, and, you know, North Korea making a fatal miscalculation about what its potentials for brinksmanship are. I mean, I, I can come up with some pretty weird scenarios. But all of them, if they're sufficient enough to, un, you know, to unsteady this country, then they're enough to unsteady it such that I don't think we can see beyond that event. Make our oh, thanks, because uh, I'm, I'm just, my name is David Kaplan. I'm a small businessman who's lived here for over 50 years, and I, I don't have a great education. But uh, we've heard very well about all the terrible problems Japan has. But by comparison, which country is better off? I mean, I'm American. I watch Fox News, and then I watch CNN, and, and I don't know what's happening to America. Uh, uh, my parents were British. I, I listened to what's happening in England, and uh, it's crazy. I, I have friends in France, and they have terrible problems. Italy and Germany, I have friends, and the immigration problem is terrible. So uh, my first question is, what country is better off than Japan? Uh, where? And uh, let me tell you, the, um, 
Um, we, we're very proud of the Michelin restaurants, and we have great restaurants, but if you've seen Michelin guides in France or other countries, it was marketing that Michelin made this guide and gave us all these, not undeserved, but great restaurants. But um, uh, on the bubble, I was here from 1962, so I, I know about the bubble. But I think it was due to over-optimism -op and, and mammoth overconfidence. And uh, I think something similar happened to America in 2008 when you had the toxic real estate loans and the world was uh, about to go bust in 2008. And it was China that brought the world out of it because they spent trillions of dollars on their economy, and now they're suffering. So China's not in, in any great condition, and I, I wouldn't want to live in China. Um, so, so anyway, that's, that's the point. And what country's better than Japan, please? Uh, I'm, I'm still sticking with New Zealand. Um, uh, Switzerland, Switzerland, Switzerland's not bad. Um, I mean, I don't think that's the point. I appreciate that. All, all of your criticisms or all your comments are correct. I, again, I'm, I'm not, I'm here for God's sake, right? You know, I voted with my feet. This is a great, a wonderful place to be. All I'm suggesting is, is that by the metrics in the world in which I live, this is the apogee of Japanese power. That in a world in which we value power, and we, you know, whether it's through, you know, military, economy, et cetera, Japan is going to have less of all of those things in the future. And there are implications that follow from that. And all I want to suggest is, is that the truth is, Japan will stay you know, a comfortable and pleasant place, but it, w it will be diminishing. It will have wonderful unicorns. It will have some great businesses that do robotics over here and AI over there and probably do some, some you know, nanotech here and uh, something else. But they're not, this country will not be, my, my sense is Japan will not be the leading light, the, 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 the international powerhouse that it has been in its past. And frankly, I mean, it's interesting in previous conversations I was asked if this is in fact the apogee of Japanese power, would they not, or, or would I agree that maybe 1930s for the historians in the room, that Japan may have been more influential? Or was it in fact in the 1980s when its economic influence was, was when, it, when it appeared ready to overtake the United States as the world's largest economy? I would say as I think about it, in terms of comprehensive national influence, no. Japan is it's at its greatest today. If you think about it, it's the number three economy, that it's soft power reserves, the respect that it has internationally, its capacity, you know, that it is living off of, of great cultural achievements and extraordinary aesthetic, that it has an energetic and, and skillful prime minister who is filling a space in international leadership that, quite frankly, my country has created. So in all of those ways, this is a moment at which I think Japan is truly at its greatest peak in the international system. And it's all downhill from here. And again, let's be clear, that isn't a bad thing because it reflects the culture, the preferences, the ideas of, of this society. And I can actually construct a society, as you think about it, that we could better adapt goals and policies and outcomes that really better match what this country has, it's, it, what its resources and capabilities are. But that ain't where we are now. And that gap, that disjuncture, is what troubles me. Uh, George Maddock, I work with DigiNex, a blockchain cryptocurrency company. So no, I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to go back to the, the chips and the manufacturing of Jap in Japan. What was it? You have such highly educated people. Why did they miss the step from manufact the shift from manufacturing to you know, where we are now, the digital piece. So why didn't, you had companies when I went to university where the Sony Walkman came out. You know, we don't use that anymore, we use iPods. And that shift to more technology side. So why didn't they just abandon the manufacturing or move, have a 
progressive way out of the manufacturing. I think the government showed ways in the you know, 50s and 60s leading up to the Olympics what they could do and wh how they could change and reshape. Why didn't that happen again? Besides the Walkman, what else did they invent? Pardon me? Well, the trick of the Walkman was is that Marita said we're not going to put the recording capacity in it, which makes it small and portable. That was the innovation. And the answer, and I think that's the answer. We've moved into an era in which what the Japanese are great at is small, reliable, building better products. When they can see something in front of them, I mean, historically, you look, I mean, this is the cheap, easy explanation, right? Is this that Japan proved during, the, during the, the post war era, as long as it could see where it had to go, it was great at getting there. The problem was what happened when Japan reached the front? Yeah. It is not necessarily an educational system that teaches innovation, creativity. I mean, every, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to the professors in the room as to how accurate that assessment is, but I haven't heard anybody ever disagree with me. Consequently, you teach reliability, you teach teamwork, you teach process efficiencies. That's what the Japanese are absolutely the best at. And unfortunately, we've moved into an era in which you can maybe build a better processing system or a better manufacturing system, but it doesn't provide you a sufficient comparative advantage, especially when you don't have the people to manufacture. So my argument, and I'm not, you know, I'm not a student of the, of the industrial economy. I suppose TAG probably has a pretty good answer to this one maybe as well. But that's, I think that's the problem, this is that we've moved into an innovation space, not necessarily one that is really about continuing refinement of process. That's what the Japanese are absolutely the best at. And consequently, this, the inability to understand what the next big thing is, or to create the next big thing, that's what's undermined the economy in this era. All of their comparative advantage, not all, but much of their comparative advantage has been leached out by the, you know, the idea that other folks can, I mean, the fact that Samsung has bested Sony in so many different ways, and Japanese companies, it tells you what almost all you need to know. And the Chinese are coming. Well, I mean, you know, one of the things I do in the book, which is really, uh, which was kind of fun, but also probably naive, was that I went through all of these damned government plans. You know, what's striking is from the 1990s on, there is study after study from METI, from Keidanren, from Keizai Doyukai, from uh, uh, Kokomonken, uh, from uh, this prime ministerial commission and that one. And every single one of them says we are at a crisis and we're at a crossroads. That we have, you know, that Japan has a choice. I mean, there are literally quotes where we have a choice between we revive the Japanese nation, and I don't mean it in that negative sense, but we, we revive our economy and our, f our future and our purposes, or we sink beneath the sea. You know, it's rebirth or death. And, you know, the Japanese have had no doubts whatsoever about what the choices were, what the options were, what the potential consequences of not making choices are. And yet, they have persistently not made a choice. They've persisted. And that's a choice. So, the answer is why? I mean, that's, you know, one of the interesting things to tie this back to this whole idea of March 11th was Prime Minister Abe had an agenda. I mean, this is a guy who clearly sees he wants to get things done. And we may agree or disagree with what his ultimate objectives are. But nonetheless, this guy has some ideas. Now, again, some of them are contradictory. I mean, the tension between economic growth and abenomics and womenomics and the degree to which you, how you reconcile traditional roles of women in the society and the idea that you tap them because that is really the last place you're going to get productivity, well, that's a tough one to square. Similarly, and you have to give him credit, with TPP and the CPTPP, the degree to which the agricultural lobbies were always a huge impediment to any deal and yet they still pushed that through. So it deserves a lot of credit for that. But nonetheless, I've always been struck by the fact that you had this incredible crisis on March 11th, and yet this government never instrumentalized it in ways that would have allowed it to overcome whatever resistance if perhaps they knew what they wanted to do. Makes me, makes me think they didn't know what they wanted to do. I mean, interestingly enough, the DPJ, actually, you look at there was a thing called the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the policy unit, which was in the cabinet office, and they wrote a strategy for the rebirth of Japan. I mean, that was literally the title of it, you know, which talks about the need for change and talks about the potential, precisely, what the consequences would be of not embracing change. And, what ha and, and they came up with this, it was, it's, it's really quite funny, they had committees like on happiness 
and uh, wisdom and stuff. I mean, it was really it was kind of fun. And all of my policy friends tell me that I was just being silly by paying, giving a lot of faith to these policy pronouncements and all these grand designs and everything. But the fact is that there was clear awareness of what was going on and the need to address this stuff. And yet they didn't. And to me, the fact that Prime Minister Abe never used March 11th as a means, as a tool, to galvanize the nation. I mean, we came close when there was all this nonsense about Kizuna, right? Let's all come together and pull together as a single country. But most of the people, and interestingly enough, the students I talked to all said that they were being very cynical. Oh, this is just a way to manipulate us. This is silly. So how do you reconcile the understanding in Abenomics for structural change, particularly, for example, in the third arrow, right, this great change that has to happen, the OECD says that if we don't have structural change in Japan, the GDP will shrink 25% by 2040. Clearly, it's, we know what has to happen. And yet, the government's not making the effort to use every tool it can to bring about that change. Uh, that's what leads me to think this is as good as it gets. Uh, hi, my name is Michi Mimaranoshi. I'm teaching international politics at Gakushin University. Uh, if you, your talk is uh, about the decline of Japan, uh, if you look at Japan from in, gro in uh, other globe, uh, in a, a, other country in the globe, but if you focus a little more and look at Japan in Asia, I think it is a vic relative prosperity of non-democracies and relative decline <laughs> of Japan. Uh, my question is, how can uh, a democracy be less functional than the, uh, the non democracies. Uh, I was in Shanghai before, and I remember vividly a Chinese uh, 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 scholar say, well, I'm so very sorry, pitiful about the Japanese politicians who are busy with elections. During that time, our statesmen can study. So in that sense, I think how, uh, is it true that democracies are supposed to be working better than non democracies? If not, why? And uh, is it good? Or at least I cannot imagine that uh, through electoral pro process of Japan, we can uh, improve the way you hope the Japanese to do. Joan? Thank you. Uh, Joan Anderson from Sokogaka International. Uh, my question is, uh, I want to hear more about women, and I want to hear about what the artists said, please. I, I, I'm very interested in all the economic and political stuff, but I'd like you to give us a bit more flavor from the voices of women and artists. Thank you. All right. Um, you know, many Asian countries like Korea and China are also going to get very old very quickly. And uh, if you look at the population curve also, the uh, <clears throat> developed countries in the world are also aging very rapidly. and. I would see that there are, there's going to be a peak out of all these countries pretty soon, within the next, um, by the end of the century. And um, what would be, uh, and then um, relatively, Japan's position relatively would not get too bad in, in such a scenario when everybody else goes down. And what is your position on that one? I'm, I'm getting old too. Um, I'm, I'm, there are countries for old men, I think. Cormac McCarthy was wrong. Yeah. Um, let's see, first, to professor from Gakushin University. Um, you know, that's frequently an argument that's made that, that illiberal polities are more efficient. You know, the Chinese have made that case, and they, uh, unfortunately, it seems to be an increasingly popular view. Uh, and that's, I mean, one of the more interesting questions that we've got right now, which unfortunately I don't have time to answer in this, in, 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 to your question, is the degree to which we are seeing, you know, this, a, a genuine ideological struggle between different types of political systems. And I think that that is the real challenge, if you will, that's represented in the BRI in some senses and in the, the competing notions of international regional governance supported, so for example, by the free and open Indo-Pacific. And, you know, th there is, unfortunately, you know, the truth of the matter is, liberal democracies are a minority in the world, and we're, for a variety of reasons, losing our uh, representation, right? The, the, the number of liberal democracies in the world is, is decreasing right now. And yet, we would argue, and I mean, I happen to believe it's a better system of government, but at the same time, we would also argue that we should be promoting an international order based on democratic principles. So the weird um, 
the oxymoron here is, is that we're promoting liberal democracy through illiberal principles, right? A minority of democratic countries is trying to push its principles on the rest of the world. And the fact of the matter is there is a great deal of pushback about notions of values, of free, about normative order in Asia in particular. And if we talk about a free and open Indo-Pacific, free is contested. There aren't a lot of governments that you can speak to that are really prepared to put their money on free and to push that as a critical part of the foreign policy platform. So the answer to your question is, is that it is, it is a tough sell these days. And in the absence of a, I th um, sadly, better example in the West, we're going to have the sell is going to get tougher. Uh, Joan, women. Um, I like women too. Um, The stuff in the book on womenomics is probably nothing that you haven't seen before. You know, a lot of Kathy Mitsui, a lot of uh, the usual research on the subject, uh, the, the usual studies. The artist stuff, I, one of the drafts of the book, was there was an entire chapter. One of, I thought was one of the most interesting chapters, solely devoted to artists' statements about March 11th and Japanese identity. There's been some wonderful literature that's come out of this. There's been some good performance art. Um, I spoke to some actual, you know, uh, sculptors and painters that discussed the impact of March 11 and their notion of Japanese identity on who they were. I mean, it, it, there's, there's, the thing that I would say is buy the book and read that, read that section. It's uh, the chapter on March 11th, I think. But the point was is that the best expressions, I think, of the damage that was done to the Japanese on March 11th was really, I think, best expressed by the artists. And, and, and there's some wonderful short stories that are written about, th that try to understand, and, you know, in, in the way that artists do, that capture the loss, that capture, that try to understand the sense of, of, of absence and, and of the impact of this extraordinary catastrophe. And that the damage that it did to Japan and its conceptions of a society that was capable of managing um, uh, a crisis of the scale. There's um, Azuma Hiroki, I believe, uh, um, who writes about uh, um, uh, otaku. It was, his, I think, his PhD dissertation. He's become a great cultural commentator. Notes that you know this disaster tore us apart, and he he, he talks about the way in which this notion of Japan as a middle class society, whoever was asking about their myth, right? That 95 percent of the Japanese think of themselves as being middle class. And what happened on March 11th was is it was an utterly random event. And the randomness of it is what destroyed this notion of logic and order in Japanese society. On the one hand, I can see it as fitting in with this notion of mujo in ways that encourage this quietism and, and is perfectly acceptable within this broader philosophical construct. And at the same time, there is a certain, you know, I think it, it takes a literary sensitivity to understand the way that, the, that incidents of this type just, you know, seize at the soul of a country, right? I mean, a academics and, um, you know, uh, uh, folks that write books like this aren't supposed to use phrases like that. Um, I, I feel really uncomfortable saying that. Um, let's see. On um, John, uh, yeah, third's okay. Um, the question is how sustainable third place is, how long the Japanese will continue to be in that place. And, and I think that there is, however, you know, I didn't talk a lot about this, but this sense in this country, and I, I, this is something for all of you, I suppose, to think about. And what's interesting, well, I'll get to that, is this notion of the inwardness of Japan, the increasing sense in which the Japanese are focused internally on, on who they are, and less of a sense of engagement with the world. And that's one of the things that, across all the indices, right, the number of students that are going overseas, the number of w people that are working overseas, just this whole idea that, that Japan is increasingly turning inward on itself. And you may be the third largest economy in the world, but you are in the world in which you and I inhabit, in the way that we think about things. A country that is ultimately internally focused is a country that is marginalized and irrelevant in the important ways and places. And that, again, in the framework and in the, starting, in the place in which you and I think about how the world works, that's not a good place to be. And I think that goes to you, whoever, the question about aging Japan as well, right? And other countries are aging too. But there are dynamic countries. Uh, you, you can watch other countries, you know, Brazil, to watch how, what, what's going to happen with Germany, although it faces its own problems and it's got um, uh, um, its own, you know, internal dynamics, et cetera. It's aging as well. But I think, you know, you, you can look at India and what, what, what's going to come of it. I think that there are other countries that will be 
rising and, and will be dynamic and energetic and offering an energy and an engagement in the international system that the Japanese are not, my sense is the Japanese are not prepared to, um, to, to do. I haven't done justice to any of these questions because we're running out of time. The one thing I would just ask, I, I suppose, is I'm struck by all of the arguments that I've, I have with most people when they challenge particular pieces of my, of my analysis that by and large, everybody sort of kind of shrugs and says, yeah, so what? I mean, it's, it's, there's not a great deal here, I think, that people, that, that I found interesting is, is that very few folks are really prepared to argue that it's going to get better than this for Japan. And, you know, I, it, it's curious to me that there is such casual acceptance of these larger sense of, of Japan as a country in decline. And the question is going to be what the, ram the implications and consequences of that are for Japan and for the world. And, and they don't have to be terrible, but I do think they are more significant than most people give them credit. Thank you, 9 o'clock. Thank you for uh, indulging me today. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, the book is available. Um, I'm sure it's going to get better for TUJ, if not for Japan. Uh, but as you know, we are a very poor university. Uh, so we can't offer you an honorarium, but here is an extra bottle of water. Uh, so thanks again. Uh, I'm very lucky to have known you, I think, for what, 20, 50 years? I forget. Uh, and uh, also on uh, Thursday, in two days, we have David Chin, a retired colonel, U.S. Army, a professor at National Intelligence University, who will brief us on North Korea and Kim Jong-un. And very few people, I think, are more qualified than David uh, to speak to this topic. So we hope to see you on Thursday. Thanks again. Thank